Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone of solid ground, firmly the fears this drought and sore. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of alone who took on flesh, full as a God in helpless faith, his gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, who on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay. Light of the world by dark his slay. Then bursting forth in righteousness. On from the grave he rose. stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, but with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of First cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no stream of man can ever block me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I stand. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. I am weak, but thou art strong. I'm all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as you walk. Let me walk close to thee. Just a just a lost, just a lost soul. 
just a closer walk, 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 just a closer walk. has changed. I think in some cases even the attitude has changed this morning. Thank you Eric for that amazing rendition of Let It Be. We continue today in the second message or second part of the message we began last week entitled God Where Are You? We're in the same series uh, Courageous Christianity and we're looking at what it takes what what it means to live a courageous Christian life in the context of which we find ourselves day in and day out in our lives. Uh, this message, God, Where Are You?, is based on uh, the idea that uh, David experienced some of the same trials and tribulations that you and I experienced, and particularly in reference to his flight from Saul or his son Absalom, uh, David experienced a profound sense of social isolation, cultural isolation, kingdom isolation. Uh, he was separated from his friends and his family, and he felt lonely. And I wonder today in our COVID-19 world, how many of us and how many people that we know are experiencing a profound sense of loneliness. And so uh, we looked at David last week in Psalm 13, how he cried out four times, you know, where are you, Lord, basically? Don't forget me. Have you forgotten me? Don't forsake me. We looked at that and we said in the sentiment there is, is that it's almost as if life was going on with David as it would customarily go on, but the absence of the Lord was just profoundly uh, uh, sensed by David. And I wonder if that's not the case for you and I many times, that we go through the motions in our life and then we wake up one moment or something happens and then we all of a sudden are struck with this sense of, where are you, Lord? Lord, where are you? And so we continue in this second uh, part of this message. And last week we concluded uh, with just one principle is that we needed to take everything to the Lord in prayer. That's the way we would say it in the vernacular of a song. Take everything to the Lord in prayer. And while that sounds familiar, while that even sounds somewhat practical, it's somewhat ethereal. I mean, there's really no concreteness to that. What do you mean, take it to the Lord in prayer? Well, in, in every sense of the word, you know, uh, prayer, it can mean so many different things in so many different circumstances. And you ask one person like Leanne, what is prayer? What do I mean by prayer? And you ask somebody like, you know, Tim or Brittany, you know, what do I mean by taking it to the Lord in prayer? And I would imagine that we would get a host of answers. A whole different host of answers. Not that any of them would be more correct or less correct than the others, but we would get such a, 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 a difference in answers that it's hard for us to put down something that would be called a principle. A principle that we could say is in concrete, that's, that's right there. And so that's what I want to do today is, is not negate the necessity of prayer, but I want to supplement the prayer. Not only that we would pray, not only that we would pray for certain things, but there's also a personal responsibility that we bear. 
Now, I want to do a little bit of undressing here. It's not in my notes, and it won't be in the notes that go out later this week, but I have to make some admissions here. Confessions. You know, Dr. Bennett said that confession is good for the soul, but bad for the reputation. I have to make a confession here that when I have been many times in the deepest and darkest moments in my life, for example, in 1998, we moved, Debbie and I did, from San Diego, California to here, to North Carolina, my wife had never experienced a place quite like this. Ray was complaining about North Carolina and Wilmington in general when he first got here, Ray Merritt Sr., and that lady asked, you know, well, if you don't like it so much, I'll give you a bus ticket back. Ray, thankfully, didn't take that, and we experienced Rayford Merritt uh, all the years that we did, and what a pleasurable experience for the most part that was for us. But she came, and she wasn't having a pleasurable experience at all. You know, we had been married there in 1998 for 11 years. And uh, I started doing things like going to work while she was still working. We were living in a little camper trailer in my parents' backyard. We hadn't even found a place to stay in the three months that we were here. And the next thing you know, out of the blue, it comes to me. She says, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I was devastated. I mean, to me, it really did come out of the blue. I had no indication. I was just dumbfounded. And in a matter of a month and a half, she was gone back to Oregon. Her father came and got her, and they drove back across country. And so in the ensuing months, through October and November and December and January of 99, you know, I, I was here. I had come back to Lake Forest and, and, and began to you know, tune my heart back to the Lord where I had been away from the Lord for so long. And I was praying, Lord, you know, what am I supposed to do? And one day it occurred to me that I was waiting for the Lord to ride it in the sky, you know, like them airplanes. When all the time it was in my heart, I knew what to do. I just didn't want to do it because it meant swallowing my pride. And so I took the practical step. I accepted the invitation and the salutation that she offered. And this was basically it. If you'll come get me, I'll come back. And so there I flew across the country to Oregon rode two and a half hours back from the airport to get my wife and the vehicle loaded up and things come back. And you know what happened? We got snowed in for a whole weekend. There I was with my father-in-law and mother-in-law, which were wondering what in the world their daughter was thinking. What about this guy, you know, that she had walked away from, all those things. I tell you that story not to, not to embarrass myself or my wife, but I tell you that story because I believe that we have personal responsibilities in every area of our life that we need to take seriously. And when it comes to this matter of loneliness, there are some practical things that we ourselves need to take a handle on and take action. And so it's not just a matter of praying, Lord, give me friends. It's we have a responsibility too. I like the King James Version, and particularly in certain instances when it renders things favorably to my messages. And so I want to quote Proverbs 18.24. It says, He who desires to have friends must he himself be friendly. See, that's a practical word right there. And that's something that people that are lonely sometimes need to hear, painful as it might be. And so as you turn to Psalm 42, which will be the kickoff text for our message today. Uh, Let us keep that very practical application focused to our mindset today. This is not going to be a theology lesson per se, but it's going to be a very practically based message to say, beyond prayer, what's my personal responsibility when we encounter difficulties in general, but loneliness is the point of today's message. So 
What are we going to learn in Psalm 42? Let's begin with the reading of Psalm 42, verses 1 through 5, where I believe we can get a sense of David's life. And then a uh, uh, last verse, verse 5, is, is a direction for the message the rest of this day. Re beginning with verse 1 in Psalm 42, As a deer pants for wa water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. Can you hear the longingness there in, in, in the pictures there that David is for his longing for God's fellowship? He goes on and he says, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come up here before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember and pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and they lead to the procession into the house of God where the voice of joy and thanksgiving and a multitude of keeping fest festival. Verse 5 concludes and it says, it says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him for the help of His presence. Let's pray. Lord, I pray, Lord, that You would minister to so many people, Lord, even beyond the walls of this building today, uh, through the power and the truth of this message, that loneliness, Lord, can be solved. First, with a relationship with the Son, Jesus Christ. Secondly, with a body called the body of Christ. And Lord, only these things are accomplished because of the love of God, which extends that relationship offer to each and every, every individual who would take that, Lord, seriously and receive that. And Lord, for us, Lord, as I said yesterday from this same place, that we ourselves as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ would not grow weary in doing good. But Lord, as we see the day coming that we would double our effort Lord in the name of Jesus we pray amen I want to uh, make sure that we understand this text here before we leave it because we'll be leaving it to go survey some other text in here Psalm 42 and 43 were actually one one psalm at a time and so sometime in the uh, construction of the canon of the Bible they were separated out we know that because there's a rhythm or a cadence that goes on here it's what uh, scholars call couplets here. We have verses 1 through 5 that end with this exclamation here of this, why is your soul you know, downcast or saddened? And we have this again, that same thing. If you look at verse 11 there, it says, why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? And if you go down to Psalm 43, verse 5, it says, why are you in despair, O Oh, my soul, and why are you disturbed within me? Again, hope in God, for I shall again praise Him. So the, the song is really kind of like what we would call a chorus. This verse 5 in chapter 42, verse 11 in chapter 42, and verse 5 in chapter 43 is what we would call in our song or hymnody today a chorus. And so we have three verses that, that explain where he is at. Uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally. And then we have, why are you downcast? And in, this, in the song of the chorus here in the psalm, he's saying that my hope, my hope, my hope, as it always has been and always will be, is in God. And so let's not forget that David was in extreme distress. He was on the run from Saul for over eight years. Can you imagine that? being outcast he had been anointed by the, the you know the prophet and the priest that he would be the next king but for eight years he was on the run and that's where this song picks up is somewhere in the middle of that eight years while he was on the run and it really picks up in the first practical principle that i want to give to you today uh, of the four principles is principle number one to preserve life to preserve life it might sound a little odd, uh, this principle, when we talk about loneliness, but I think we need to also understand that suicide is at an all-time high in our nation. And it's not because people have too many friends. It's not because they have too many good relationships. It's quite the opposite. It's the profound sense of the absence of any connection to people and groups of people, tribes of people, family, 
that causes people to go into a deep, dark depression, many times ending with suicide. And so we need not to ignore the necessity of preserving life. We see this exercise first in David. When David understood that Saul was after his life, wouldn't it have been silly for just David to hang out and wait to be killed? David sought to preserve his life. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 20. Turn in your copy of God's Word to 1 Samuel chapter 20. When I see all your fingers stop moving on your phones or your tablets. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, look down at verse 42. This is, a, this is a, the whole first uh, chapter there in in 1 Samuel 20 is a conversation of about a relationship between Jonathan, Saul's son, and David, the anointed king. And basically what's happened in the context there, there's been a conversation where, where Jonathan sees the anger and, and the hatred of his father toward David, and he reaches out, and but David reaches back out to Jonathan, and they say, hey, you know, what are we going to do about this? And David says, your dad's out to kill me. And he says, I can't believe that. And he says, well, let me go investigate and find out. And so Jonathan comes back in the early part of that chapter and basically reports to David, says, you know, you're right. You know, you're right. And you need to take off. And in verse 42, we read, Jonathan said to David, go in safety inasmuch as we have sworn to each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord will be between you and me and between my descendants and your descendants forever. Then he, meaning David, arose while Jonathan went into the city. You see, David took, uh, uh, took his life to be very precious. He knew that he was the anointed to be the next king after Saul, but he didn't know what that meant. He didn't know when that would come about. And so his first consideration was for the very practical thing of preserving life. And so if you know, or if you are yourself, a very lonely person, Watch out, because the devil will seek to isolate you and to put you in depression and to even despise your own life. And when that happens, those thoughts will come. This world would be a better place without me. No one would notice even if I were to disappear today. It wouldn't make a hill of beans to anyone should I cease to live. All those thoughts will come to mind. Or uh, thoughts like this. What has my life made any difference? Has my life made any difference at all to anyone? And when we, we start thinking about purpose and meaning to life, all the more we start to think about the negative thoughts of self and the opposite of preserving life, but rather taking life instead. So the first thing David was was to care for his life by fleeing Saul and the life-threatening situation that Saul presented to him. Loneliness aside, though, there are other circumstances which this principle of preservation of life applies to. Did you know that according to the BBC, who recently wrote an article and had a news release, that worldwide domestic violence is up over 20%. There are some countries where it's over 50% around the world. And, and, and whether it's domestic violence against women or against men, because ladies, it does happen the other way around. But whether it's against one or the other, let me tell you, there's a time when you have to make a decision that preservation of life over a relationship is more important. And so this principle not only applies in the case of just loneliness, but it applies to uh, so many other things, is that preservation of life is very important. So don't neglect that. Don't neglect that. Second principle is the preservation or to preserve health. To preserve health. In the next chapter over, 1 Samuel 21, David's a man on the run. He has not just one or two or three, but he has many people that are with him. And now keep in mind, you can be alone in a crowd. You ever experienced that, to be alone in a crowd? Psychology Today wrote an article, I think it was earlier this month or the month before, and, and that's exactly what they said. I want to read what they said here in the notes. It said that loneliness is a personal subjective experience which is not defined by quantity of relationships but of their subjective quality. 
it goes on to say, it says, not all lonely people live in isolation. A person might have many friends around them or live with a partner, yet still feel a deep ache of emotional sense of loneliness. So we can be alone even in the midst of people. And I believe David experienced that also. In 1 Samuel 21, what we see here is one of the first places that David runs when he's on the run from King Saul is to a place called Nob. A place named Nob. And there he, he meets a, a priest named Abimelech. He's there and, and he says, you know, uh, the preservation of life is the principle that we're thinking about here now. And he goes on and he says, you know, do you have any food? You know, me and my men were on the run. Do you have any food? And you know, the priest says, no, we don't have any food. <clears throat> Nothing except for the showbread here, which was designated by Levitical law to be for the priests they, themselves. And David said there in verse 3, he says, therefore, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. And then the priest says in verse 6, he says, so the priest gave the consecrated bread, for there was no bread there in the presence. It was removed from for the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place when it was taken away. And so David went out and he said, it's so important that I provide not only for myself, but for those others. Remember, he asked for five loaves of bread. So there was more than one person with him, more than likely. And so he said that this is important. Now, when it comes to our sense of loneliness and isolation, let me tell you something. Diet is important. Diet is important. Diet is important to your health. A poor diet can have uh, a very detrimental consequences to your health, in other words. I remember when uh, my mother-in-law was far along in her life, uh, passed away now for almost three years, three years this month, as a matter of fact. We would go on vacation, and I would get up quite early, as I normally would do, 3.30 in the morning. Sometimes I would get up even earlier. And it, it was not infrequent for me to find either remnants of her being up in the middle of the night and having eaten uh, bowls of Doritos or potato chips or, you know, uh, all kinds of chips and, and things like that or remnants of a sandwich on the counter half eaten. And even though she was an extreme diabetic, eat everything and anything that was, particularly if it was sweet. And, and it, it took a toll on her health. And the children implored, and her husband implored her, and she just didn't ever listen. I don't know what it is. It's almost like this. Uh, many of you remember some of our, our saints that in the days when smoking was in vogue, that would just would never give up after lung surgery, after being on oxygen. There's some of there's some members, old time members that just Dolores Stottlemyre was a, a good example of that. You know on oxygen and smoking just wouldn't give it up what we put in our bodies both nutrition wise and externally and other things is very important because guess what and my brother can testify to this down here you go long enough without food and water and this thing up here don't work too good anymore and so what a bad situation that you have now even gets worse and so you're thinking you know where are you getting this from scripture and why is this you know so simple well, I think it's so simple that we just overlook it. That's the dietary law that God gave His people to keep them from being ill from eating things. And there's actually a book, a, a good-selling book called The Maker's Diet that's out there even now that tells us how to eat healthily right from the Old Testament Scriptures. So don't take these principles, these first two principles, the principles of preservation of life and the principle of preservation of health too lightly, too swiftly. Because what I think you're going to find out is that it's not necessary to dismiss simplicity just for simplicity's sake. Because if you can't do the little things and the simple things, what makes you and I think that we can do even the more difficult things before building on the simple? I'll give you an illustration. I recently heard of a woman who suffered from an aversion to the outside world. Maybe you know somebody that's scared of public spaces and places and even large crowds of people. Well, this woman had some experiences in public. 
uh, at the grocery store, and even in church, became embarrassed so much to, that she was fearful of being in public. She was first isolated to her house and then eventually bedridden all the time long. She had no physical uh, health issues that the doctors could find. Everybody, including the doctor, says it's all up here. And she lived in her bed for, for an extended period of time. This was a Christian woman now. And in her prayer life, she began to pray, Oh God, I really want to do something great for you in your kingdom's work. Give me something that I can do that would be great in your kingdom's work. And then it, she said this in the report, that it was as if a voice spoke to her, not audibly, of course, but in that inner, small, still voice, it said, Make your bed. Make your bed. And she kept praying, she kept praying, she kept praying, and then it came again. Make your bed. Make your bed. And she said, God, I want to do something great for you. What are you talking about? Make my bed. Exactly, Manly, she had to get up first. She had to get out of bed to make the bed, and therefore, when she had made the bed, she was ready to do something for God. I think this principle is echoed in the New Testament in, in the teaching of Jesus when he talked about the people who he would entrust with things in the kingdom's work. He said this in Matthew chapter 25. His master came back after entrusting his servants with these responsibilities. He said this. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant or slave. He says, You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. It's not until we're faithful with the little things, the preservation of life, the preservation of health, that we can begin to be a useful instrument. Dr. Bennett used to lament pastors in particular who were a poor representative of a person who did not take good care of their physical body. Because let me tell you, it's this physical body that allows me to motivate, locomote to this place versus that place in order to speak the counsel of God. He used to say it's a poor thing that, that preachers look more like a, a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken than a French fry. You know what he's saying? Okay. Okay. We have to be faithful in the little things like getting out of bed, making our bed in order that we can do the things that God has called us to do. We need to take care of the physical body and let's not ignore, we need to take care of the spiritual body too. We need to take care of the spiritual body and this is not in my notes, but it, the Lord said you need to tell them about this. Look, if you go, like Dr. Bennett would say, what does seven days without a Bible make? It makes one week. W-E-A-K, not W-E-E-K. If you're not being fed by the Word of God on a daily basis, why would you take in physical food in its place? Hmm? If you have more care about the physical body than the spiritual body, maybe you need to stop eating and start reading the Word in its place. Your word have I desired more than my necessary food, Job said. So take seriously the preservation of oneself, the entire self. Not only the physical, but the spiritual as well. Principle number three, take your eyes off of yourself. Take your eyes off of yourself. If you are prone to be, oh, poor, pitiful me, get your eyes off of yourself and look maybe at somebody else that's worse off than you. I rode out of here yesterday after the funeral. I was the first vehicle out of here to go to Oakdale. And what did I see on my way was a homeless man. That's nothing unusual around here. But let me tell you, there's a world of difference between a guy who in 1985 or 86 or 87 looked at a homeless man on the street of La Mesa, California and said, get off your ass and get a job, you lazy bum. Then what my heart told me the other day. To love mercy and compassion to one another. To do justice and have compassion on my fellow man. Take 
our eyes off of ourselves. I think David illustrated this principle again when he says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you been disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I again will praise Him. He's taking his eyes off and that little chorus off of himself. And he's saying, my hope is not on this, you know, earth, but it's in the God of heaven and earth. And beside, in addition to that, I believe that we need to understand this, is that taking our eyes off of ourselves might include not talking about ourselves, not listening to ourselves, but listening to godly, wise advice from others. Beth said yesterday, that her dad trained those kids, Ray Jr. and her, to, to have an opinion about everything and sometimes give advice even when it's not asked for. I know a lot of people that are willing to give advice, but godly advice is something different. Godly advice is important. I, I, I think, uh, if I look here at my reference here, it's in 1 Samuel chapter 25 along verse 10. What's been going on is David is still a man on the run he comes out, and, he, and Samuel has died at the beginning of that chapter. The whole nation of Israel has went through this, you know, morning season of mourning. And David and his cohort, there's about 400 of these guys that are with David. And they come, and they beseech upon this guy named Nabal. The name Nabal in, in Hebrew means fool. Okay? And he literally was a fool. Because when David sent emissaries to Nabal and said, hey... Would you mind basically sharing with us some of, some of your produce, some of your flock, in order that we would be able to have sustenance? Nabal, very foolishly, uh, uh, contrary to the Hebrew custom now, it was customary to do this. He said, who is David and who is Jesse? That I should give of my stuff to them which I do not know. David was known. It wasn't as if his name wasn't a household name, so to speak. He's not without the territory. He's not living in the land of the Philistines here. This is in the land of Judah. He's within 100 miles of where he began his, his flight. And this guy, Nabal, proves himself a fool. And so when the emissaries go back, they report this to David. And you know what David says? You're up, guys. We're going to go take care of this fool. And so David runs out with a, a, a red-hot anger in his heart. And he says, we're just going to take it and we're going to wipe him out. And, and he goes and he's met on the road by Abigail, this fool's wife. She had better sense than he did. And she implores him to overlook the foolishness of her husband. And she offers up so much goods to him and says, David, basically says, David says, why do you want to commit this uh, wicked deed and have this blood on your hands? Here, take, go and eat. And forgive this fool. You know what? David listened. David listened to godly advice. Just like you and I, when we're in a lonely stretch or in a place or a, a, some peril or trial, we need to listen to godly advice. And if you know somebody that's feeling... Uh, a, a extreme sense of loneliness today, maybe they need some godly advice. Like, hey, get up and make your bed. Yeah. Have you ever thought about leaving your house? In today's social isolation and shelter in place, uh, there's probably more people that have self-induced isolation and loneliness than ever before. Perhaps it's time that we should listen to some godly advice. Also, not only to listen you know, to others in godly advice, taking our eyes off of ourselves may also include looking to help others. Looking to help others. In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 9, we're introduced to this one that's called Dorcas, or in Greek, Tabitha. It said that she was a worker of good deeds. In fact, in fact verse 36 it says, Now in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which is translated in Greek, Dorcas. Had it backwards, sorry. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. You know what happened to her? Dorcas got sick and died. Got sick and died. But you know what? A great miracle occurred. 
Peter was in the region, and when Peter heard, Peter came back and, and cast out all the people, says, get out of here. And he went over and said, Tabitha, rise. And she was resurrected. She was brought back to life. Now think about this. What we know about Tabitha or Dorcas is very little, but what we do believe, generally speaking, is that she was a widow. And that she was about... Now, you think about a widow in that culture. It's hard to imagine. But they, they were not well looked upon and not well cared for. But she was a Christian. And despite her poverty, whatever that might have been, she was known for good deeds. Doing good things for other people. And more than likely, it was... You do good deeds for other people when they are in worse case than you are, right? And so she was doing for people that were in worse predicament than her. She wasn't looking at her widowness and her poverty, but gave of herself, just as we read in 2 Corinthians about the Macedonians, which out of their poverty gave. See, they took her eyes off of herself, were concerned about that, and that gave God an opportunity through Peter to work a great miracle. And at the end of Acts chapter 36, it says, and many people believed because of this. It brought glory to God. And many people believed because of that one person, Dorcas. What if Dorcas had never lived that life? Then the occasion for Peter to raise her never would have happened. Then the glory of God would have been contained. And quite likely, some would have not seen and understood that the God Peter spoke of was the one and only true God. I was recently overheard or found or came to the story about a lady that was recently widowed. She writes this, and I want to quote. She says, on January 5th, I discovered what true loneliness was. You see, that on that day, my husband of 37 years died. She says, on that day, I felt as though I had also died, yet I was still alive. There's some of you who can resonate with that here. She, says, he, she goes on, she says, there, she says, there was now a huge void in my life. Since I was still alive, I knew that it meant I needed to go on. In order to do that, I began to look around our congregation. This was a church-going woman. I saw many widows and widowers. And there were also uh, many other members who, for one reason or another, who were alone. As much as I missed the conversations with my husband, I soon realized that perhaps these others might also be stuck for conversation. Going on, her words. So I came up with a plan. That's called practicality. Being practical in life. I came up with a plan, she says. She says, whenever I began to feel lonely, I would call someone. Hearing the voice of a friend was help to me. If, if ever you find that you're feeling alone, try these tips. Number one, she said, pick up the phone and call someone. Number two, send a card to someone. And number three, get up, make your bed. No, I'm just joking. She said, visit someone. Visit someone, especially those who may be homebound or in a nursing home. I might not ever know what it's like to live in that particular case as a widower or in a nursing home. But I can tell you from being down the halls of nursing homes many times, and there was a lady that I loved very much in this church. And for three years, I was one of only two people that visited her. I visited her every Saturday. I don't tell you that to toot my horn, but I'm telling you there's people that are profoundly lonely all around us. And they need us to be very practical even when we ourselves are in our loneliness and reach out perhaps first to them more so than anyone else. And that's very practical. And finally, the fourth principle is to dismiss the myth of vicarious living. Dismiss the myth of vicarious living. It's pervasive in our society of social media today that all we do primarily as young adults, although there's not a whole lot here today, younger adults, 
that life is really nothing but li- looking on Facebook, Snapchat, or one of those other social media things. Life is not living on a phone or an iPad. That is not life. That is called vicarious living. Jesus came, as I said yesterday, not to make bad people good, but to make dead people live. And living is not life on a phone, on a screen, on a computer. Jesus said the thief is the one who comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. He says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Not remotely. It didn't begin in the uh, the Scriptures in Genesis and there was iPhone and there was iPad. We need to stop living vicariously, which is a form of isolation, and make real meaning contact with people. With people. I, I can't tell you... I, Telling on somebody, she's not here, so I can talk about her, right? We had a niece come into town and plop down on the couch, and there they were. I took a picture of them, both my wife and the niece. Guess what they were doing? Neither one of them talking to one another in the same room. And I'm going, what kind of is that? I'll give up. I'll give up. Life is like this. Paul described what true life is as for a Christian. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And, and I would say that we need to understand the exegetical understanding here is that Christ lives this life through me. He lives His life through me. He says, in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself up for me. That's what real life is. It's when we can pare away all what the world would say and the world system would say about living in life, then we'll stop living vicariously. Through others, through social media, whatever the case may be. Parents, don't live your life through your children. Don't make your children be you know, the next Babe Ruth just because you love baseball. Don't make her to be the next beauty queen because you just always had an aspiration to do that. They're not like that. You can't pattern life for your children like that. Proverbs tells us, train up a child in a way he should go. Verse 6 of chapter 22, train up a child in a way he should go and when he's old he will not depart it. Another way to say that, and probably a precise and more accurate way, is that train up a child according to their bent. Their personality, who God has created them to be. What God has created and the purpose for which God has created that individual. And don't live vicariously through them. So to recap, we said today that there's basically four principles. Uh, First is to preserve life. Second, to preserve one's health. And then that also goes out to greater extensions. Preserving one's health sometimes does preserve life. Meaning taking care to eat and take care of the physical body and to nourish the spiritual man and woman also will help preserve life in general. Then to take our eyes off of ourselves. And then finally we conclude with dismissing the myth of vicarious living. We can't live through a phone. Okay? Get your mind out of Star Trek where you go over there and you punch the button and walk into the holodeck and live life. That's not, that's a fantasy. That's not the real world. Okay? Okay? And today, when I end, I want to end, uh, issue a warning. Sober warning. Especially to those who call themselves Christians. To be very careful not just to dismiss these things because they seem too simplistic. Remember, you've been faithful in the little things. Now I'll put you in charge of the greater things. It's not until we've been faithful in the little, the least, that we receive more and then grow more. It reminds me of the preacher who was asked by one of the congregants one day. He says, preacher, he says, every week you preach the same message. You know, a sin, salvation, you know, confession, you know, all these things over and over again. 
He said, what's, what's the deal? When are we going to move on? He says, well, when you begin to listen to what I'm preaching, then we'll move on. That's how we feel sometimes as preachers and teachers. Again, that goes back to the principle, maybe we need to listen a little bit more to godly advice, particularly when it comes directly out of the Word of God. I got an illustration that I would tell with this, but time gets away. And so again, our time's gone away for another week. Uh, I hope that the Lord's ministered to you and spoken to you through these words. And even deeper, taken these words and caused other thoughts to come to your mind and your heart. And that you can apply these not only in your life, but you can look into the lives of those who are around you. Perhaps offer some solace, some, some advice to help them along in, in the world in which we live today. And that, that would bring much glory to God. And if they're not a Christian, hopefully that would lead them to ask you about the reason for the hope that is within you. Remember, the psalmist David here uh, ended in this psalm, you know, my hope is in God. Our hope is in God. Your hope is in God. And maybe that will lead someone to ask you for the reason for the hope that's within you. But perhaps there's someone out here, maybe even watching online, that's not a Christian. And the, all these things sound good, right? You feel a tug in your heart. You don't know what that means. Perhaps that's the Lord calling you to draw close to Him and He will draw close to you. That you need to admit that you're a sinner and that you're in need of a Savior. There's, you're in a hopeless predicament in this thing called sin. And sin is simply to, to, to be disobedient against the will of God. Yes, yeah, sure, we can name off ten commandments. Have you ever lied? Have you ever cheated? Have you ever stolen? All those things. Sure, we can do that. But just sheer disobedience against the will of God for our lives puts us in peril of an eternal destiny to hell. Maybe you need to admit that you need relief from that. You need to repent from your sins and you need to ask Jesus who died as God on the cross in the person of the Son, for forgiveness, and that He would accept you and bring you in, adopt you into the family of Jesus Christ. And then you need to unite with a church family, a Bible-believing, preaching, teaching church, so that you can be brought up. Just like Peter says, says, desire the pure milk of the Word of God. And the writer of Hebrews says, that although you've been Christians for many, many years, you're still in need of the elementary things. We all need to be taught and instructed. Even I need to be taught and instructed. And then you need to join with that body in order to grow and to mature into Christ's likeness. You can do that today by you know, just follow me in this simple prayer. If you would bow your heads, please, church. Dear Lord, I realize that I'm a sinner and that I'm hopelessly and helplessly lost, entangled by my sin and pulled down by my sin, enslaved by my sin, and I ask you now in the name of Jesus by His shed blood on Calvary's cross to, to come down and to save me by forgiving me of my sin. I turn from my sin and I turn to Jesus, the Son of God. Like Peter said, uh, who am I? Ask the people. Uh, Jesus asked about the people. He says, you're a prophet. You're, you're Elijah. Uh, you're John the Baptist. And Peter said, no, you're the Son of the living God. A Son of the living God in the person of Jesus. Save me from my sins. I confess you this day. Lord, I want to unite with you. I want adoption through you. And it only comes through you. And I confess you even now. And I'll confess you before men in the fellowship of the church of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I thank you in advance for doing all of these things for me because of your amazing love. Because it's all about grace, not about what I'm in doing or what I will ever do. Because you loved me and died for me while I was yet a sinner. I thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.
way.